Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to another video on my channel. My name is Josh Van of ShowMeFootball.com and ArrowheadAddict.com. And before the video begins, I wanted to uh, talk to you guys about uh, the content that is going to be in this video. Um, so this is going to be my conversation that I had with Connor a few days ago. Um, I know a lot of you guys wanted a video with Connor again after the Bengals lost. You know, you wanted to hear... You know, the words out of his mouth, unfiltered after the loss. Uh, some of you don't like Connor. He's been on my channel a lot. He just tells it how it is. And uh, he, he's a polarizing figure on my channel. But I figured I would give a video to you guys who want it that has Connor in it. And Connor actually does a lot of work with my other friend's podcast at the uh, Prime Sports Network. So if you guys want to check that out too and see more of Connor uh, more frequently, then you can go and subscribe to the Prime Sports Network that I will have in the description as well as like Connor's social media and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, this video, we're just going to kind of talk about our experience at the game together since we both went to the AFC Championship. I know it's a little bit later. I had this recorded for a while, just didn't have the time to edit it. But uh, this is it right here, raw, uncut, unedited, me and Connor talking about the game and maybe some changes we would like to see made this offseason regarding the Kansas City Chiefs, their roster, the coaching staff, etc. So uh, that's all I got. Everyone, enjoy the video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe so more Chiefs fans can find this. But enjoy the video. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another video on my channel uh, slash podcast. I guess this will be uh, a little more like a podcast. But uh, I'm joined by Connor uh, for the first time in a very long time to talk about this AFC Championship game loss. Uh, we're going to be continuing our breakdown and analysis of the Chiefs' epic collapse versus the Cincinnati Bengals in the AFC Championship game. I actually went to the game with Connor. It was not a great experience. Um, and you know that if I bring Connor in, it's you, you're going to be getting the uh, pessimistic point of view. Um, and I, I'm going to be right there with him because this loss really sucked. And um, it, it's just – it's it's bad. It stings. And we have some concerns about this team. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with Connor and have been asking for him on my videos, um, you, you know, you know, what's about to go down. So anyway, Connor, how are you doing today? How have you processed this loss? And, uh, I don't know, which is, what's your initial reaction, uh, now that you've had time to soak in this game? Okay. First of all, you call me a pessimist, but let's not forget that at the game yesterday, you spent the entire second half with your face in your towel, and I still thought that we were going to win until overtime when we didn't score on the opening possession. I thought we were screwed then, but you thought we were going to lose the entirety of the second half. I Before so, then, actually, I had my face buried in my towel after they uh, failed to score on the last play of the first half. I, I told both of you guys, you and Tino, it's like, that's going to come back to haunt them. God. It, man, if they just kicked the fucking field goal there. And I understand, like, at the time, the crowd's like, oh, go for it. And I was obviously one of them. But what I, like, said several times leading up to that play just a quick out to Kelsey. If he's not open, throw it out of the back of the end zone. No harm, no foul. If he is there, touchdown. But you know, don't do anything behind the line of scrimmage. Going for it was not the wrong move. It was the play call that screwed them. Honestly, I kind of wish we saw the play that works almost every time they do it is the flip, whether it's to like um, Michael Barton or Travis Kelsey uh, right up the gut. I feel like that was a perfect time for that. And it's funny because there was that guy that was sitting a few rows below us that was like, Blake Bell, give it to Blake Bell on every he freaking He was screaming for Blake Bell every play. Every short yardage every, situation. He was, he was calling for Blake, like Blake Bell. Blake Bell was a vital part of the offense. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't know. Maybe Blake Bell would have worked there. I mean, I would have liked a Blake Bell play call rather than the play to Hill in the flats because that took up all the time. because. You could have still gone for it, and then if you didn't see anything, throw it out. Still have, like, two seconds left, and you could have at least gotten a field goal there, and that could have been the difference in the game. Yeah, it was it was unacceptable, and it's just your classic Andy Reid uh, choke job in the playoffs. And I thought we were done with those, man. I really did. 
Like we, even though ever since Patrick Mahomes has been here, we don't get them as often, or we don't really get them on like the big stage. Like, okay. The Bucks Super Bowl last year, that really sucked, but that wasn't really a choke job. I mean, we just got our ass kicked from beginning to end. Um, this was the first time that I think we had like a really just, yeah, a choke job with Reed and Mahomes. Uh, there's the 2018 AFC championship game, but again, not really a choke. Um, we just didn't have enough gas to beat the Patriots at the end. Uh, we were, you know, overmatched, but yeah, I just, that really sucks. Like I thought we were done with these. You know, uh, the last playoff game I went to was that goddamn Titans game, and this was basically the same thing. <laughs> this was worse. I'm not going to playoff games anymore. I'm not going I'm to games not. anymore. I- I'm not investing another penny into going to a game uh, where this team is involved before I see some, like, substantial progress made um, on the – really, well – See, I was going to say the roster building front, but honestly, I feel like the coaching staff could use a bit of a shakeup too, but. I'm done um, with all of them, <laughs> especially the enemy. Like, uh, there's a reason this dude doesn't have a head coaching job. I actively hope that he gets like the Jaguars job or something because he is terrible. The offense is completely stagnant whenever he calls plays. Like, and he pisses me off to no end, but at least the enemy or well at least he moves the ball. The enemy doesn't. Like you can definitely tell when the enemy or yeah, when the enemy gets the play calling because the offense just completely falls apart. It looks like a completely different unit. Well, and this more well cuz I've always kind of big uh well for a lot of the season I've been anti spags, but you were kind of indifferent, which I was surprised by, but this morning you said to me um that you're out on spag. So what, what changed for you? I'm just curious. Like what, what did he do something in this game? Like I, well, okay. First, before you answer that, I will say personally, my take on the defense is that they were good enough for the chiefs to win this game. The offense kept putting them in a bad spot, but you know, there were still some moments in that game where I'm like, why is this player on Jamar chase or why are we blitzing in that situation? But um, that being said, Connor, what what are your feelings on Spags now? What made you change your mind about him? Well, I I still don't think that he's the biggest problem or even the worst coach we have. I want to be mad if he comes back, but I'm just sick of everything about this team and uh maybe it's a the grass isn't always greener type situation and I'll regret saying that but I think that we could do better than Spags and you know uh personnel decisions like bringing in Neiman and Sorensen on third down in crucial moments and stuff like that um I still stand by the fact that if they're really that bad then Veach shouldn't have them on roster but I think we can do better than Spags and it's not necessarily like I hate Spags like a lot of people do, but I do think that we can do better, especially given the fact that he was brought here to beat Brady. He didn't do it. And now it looks like Brady's probably done. So what's the point of having a Brady killer if there's no Brady? So I'd be completely fine with uh, Mike Zimmer or Vic Fangio. I'd probably have Zimmer as my pick, uh, especially because uh, Zimmer's defense is like built on getting them to third down and just tightening up on third down and getting them off the field. And that happens a lot uh, when it comes to the Chiefs. Like we blow a lot of third downs that we just should not blow. And if our defensive coordinator has the philosophy of let's get them to third down and shut them down from there, like that's what the Vikings do. Uh, They get beat on first and second down a lot. But once you get them to third down, they're one of the best third down defenses. And I think that we're good at getting uh, teams to third down, but we just screw up and can't uh, get them off the field. Maybe that was a bit of a ramble. I'm kind of all over the place. No, I I take my Zimmer. I completely agree. Way too many times on third down. It's like someone's wide open. And I mean wide open. And 
it was a problem against the Bengals in both games. There was one play, I believe, to like T. Higgins for like 30 yards or something on third down. They gave him a first down on a scoring drive or what was later a scoring drive. And then uh, the first time, like the all out blitz on third and 27, like third and 27 just is not a play that you should give up ever. And they did it. And I saw a lot of mistakes still made in this second go around, but I don't think it's all on Spags. Obviously, some of it's personnel. Some of these guys just aren't getting it done. That can be put on Veach. It can also be put on the staff a little bit too, because I think the staff has pretty big pull on who is brought in. You know, I think you would be dumb to say that like Reed and Spags don't sign off on, you know, who they're about to bring in or sign or whatever. But it's evident this roster needs turnover very badly, especially on defense. The Bengals' offensive line was terrible all year long. The Chiefs' defensive line on paper should have owned them. They gave up nine sacks to the Titans last week, the Bengals did. And you only sacked Joe Burrow one time. And part of that is because you have bums like Frank Clark taking up a huge chunk of your cap space and doing absolutely nothing. Hitchens needs to go. Um, Neiman and Sorensen, they just don't have a place on this team. Um, their cornerback is, or their cornerback room is good for what they've spent, but you need to stop spending so low. You need a real true shutdown corner and they just don't really have one. It there's, there needs to be some major changes and some talent injection on this roster, um, particularly on defense. Initially, there's three no brainer moves to me that you have to make right off the bat. And this offseason, I think, needs to be like the last time that we lost the AFC championship, where next year our defense is a completely new unit. Um, maybe Spags is here. Maybe it's Mike Zimmer. I feel like we could do a lot worse than Spags, but we could also do better than him. Uh, so ideally, or you know how Miami hired Mario Cristobal, but they didn't fire Manny Diaz until... They already had a deal in place with Cristobal. Right. That's how I'd like to handle the defensive coordinator position. Like call up Mike Zimmer and be like, hey, you want to come be our DC? If not, we'll roll with Spags. If he does, perfect. Um, so I just do that at defensive coordinator. And uh, the three no-brainer moves to me are cut Clark because he's being paid way too much to be the 50th best D lineman in the league. Or maybe it's defensive ends. I don't know what that stat was, but he sucks. He is not worth it, his money. It was, Yeah, it was just all defensive linemen in general, the top 50 players and pass rush win rate. Yeah, he's terrible. Um, and then I'd cut Hitchens. Hitchens' contract was awful from the start. And um, he was like the only defensive player really making tackles uh, yesterday. But still, I don't think he's worth his money. We have Bolton and Gay, who are going to be our two stud linebackers. Maybe we draft another one in the draft. Maybe we don't. I don't know. But we just can't afford to keep paying Hitchens what he's getting. And I would tag and trade Tyron. Like, I get that Tyron is, like, the vocal leader of the defense. And he was uh, – he brings this attitude. And he was extremely valuable at the Super Bowl run. But I'm kind of done with him. I'll always appreciate like what he brought to that Super Bowl team because I don't think we win the Super Bowl without him. But I also feel like paying him could prevent us from winning another Super Bowl. So uh, tag him and trade him to like Detroit. I'm sure Motor City Dan Campbell would love to have that attitude on defense. So yeah, tag and trade him to Detroit. That's what I'd do. Yeah. Tyron is a player that I think he wants probably more than the Chiefs want to give him. And tagging and trading is actually something I would consider as well because you could get some picks and supplement his loss and really build this team and get younger. And like you said, I'll always appreciate Tyron for what he did. If they decide to keep him for under $20 million per year, I'm not going to hate it. But I'd definitely consider tagging and trading him because I think this Chiefs defense could, well, really the whole roster could benefit by having more money to spend. Um, it's not necessarily like the money they would get from trading Tyron would be used for the defense. I'm not, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, 
there's a lot of players that just need to go, especially Clark. You know, we talked about it, the pass rush win rate for him. He was like the worst player on that chart. And the playoff. Dewan Smoot was ahead of him. Yeah. The whole playoff Clark mantra was a total myth. And me and you called that out so many times, but fans wanted to keep believing every single year. Clark has been here. He's gotten worse um, in the regular season and the postseason. I'm just done with him. And one concern I do have about possibly letting Tyron go is that this defense truly like falls apart. Anytime he's not in the lineup, the secondary was terrible without him uh, against the bills. And it concerns me that their defense is so dependent on one player being there and that's got to get figured out. I don't know if maybe you could offset his loss by, you know, getting some picks by tagging and trading him and then signing, you know, a veteran and maybe drafting a guy, but yeah. There's, there's questions that need answers. I know I've brought it up before. I can't remember what it was. Maybe it was uh, on a Prime Sports Network episode that we did. Check that out, by the way. Uh, but I remember saying at some point that I just signed Trey Boston to a futures deal right now. And there might be some concern with him being a year out of football, but Eric Weddle was just the Rams' leading tackler, and he was retired for two years. So I'm not really concerned about that. So maybe Trey Boston's good. Maybe he's not. But still, I sign him to a futures deal just to feel safe and just kind of maybe he's one of the guys that could come in and supplement the Tyron loss. But I just, I don't know. I don't really see a future for Tyron on this team. And, you know, it sucks because, like you were talking about, he was uh, good for the Super Bowl run. But – just things like him constantly talking on Twitter, uh, hyping himself up to be more than he is, screaming at teammates like uh, at the first Bills game, just standing there with his arms out. And he's just so whiny and he's not as good as he was when he first got here. And I'm not going to say he's washed because that's such an overused thing to say. Oh, he's old and washed as soon as a player hits 29. But Tyron just hasn't been the player that we paid him to be. Yeah, I definitely gotten burnt out on him this year with some of the Twitter antics and stuff and constantly foreshadowing not being here and then like last night after the game when they lost he's like crying saying he wants to stay in Kansas City and it's like well then why were you liking uh photoshop edits of you in a Ravens jersey yeah why were you correcting the people making the photoshop saying oh I'm gonna wear 21 next year yeah like stop giving mixed signals like that's not the type of stuff we need in this locker room um also something I wanted to address real quick is that I've already noticed people starting to turn on Chris Jones after yesterday's game. And I'm not saying Chris Jones had the greatest game. And there's this stat floating around that he has no playoff sacks in 11 career postseason games. And yes, that's discouraging. But I've seen people saying that trading Chris Jones should be a possibility. That's just stupid. Chris Jones, he still had um, a handful of pressures yesterday. And the truth is the Chiefs failed him at the edge position every single year since Chris Jones has been here. Um, the Chiefs uh, pressure rate from the edge position has gone down and you just can't rely on a defensive tackle and interior player to be your entire pass rush. Hell, they were so desperate at one point that they tried moving him out to edge and what they have at edge right now is just not good enough. And they rely on Chris Jones when he gets consistently double teamed. Melvin Ingram is a nice piece, but he's getting up there and he's kind of a rotational guy. I love Melvin. I hope they bring him back, but you need more than that. And then obviously Clark has been a disaster on the other side and Chris Jones has no help. Yeah. uh, I'd also like to point out the people saying that we don't need to bring back Ingram cough, cough, Grant Morse arrowhead live. Uh, which is just ass nine. Melvin Ingram was our best D lineman this uh, postseason. But 
the thing with Chris Jones is, yeah, maybe he's been disappointing in the playoffs, but he is such a game wrecker in the regular season that you can almost deal with that in a sense. Like you said, he still gets pressure. So even if he's not getting home, he's still there. And uh, just looking at how dominant of a player he is in the regular season, we still have to get to the playoffs. So, no, trading Chris Jones would be asinine. Trading Chris Jones makes the pass rush worse. And I don't think there's already terrible. And I don't, and I don't think there's any scenario this off season where you make the D line better without Chris Jones than it is with him right now. Yeah. there. I mean, I can't even think of a player who I'd take over Chris Jones. He's up there with like DeForest Buckner and Aaron Donald and just these elite guys at the position. Uh, I mean, Aaron Donald moves all over the defensive line, but if you're talking about just purely defensive tackle, 1A and 1B are DeForest Buckner and Chris Jones. You're not getting DeForest Buckner, so, and he's not even an upgrade necessarily. So how could you possibly get better than Chris Jones? You can't. And if this Chiefs pass rush is resurgent next year, it's going to be because he's still here. Yeah, but um, I also kind of I guess really my goal for this uh, podcast was for us to talk about this game and uh, just our reaction and then kind of get into uh, the roster and some of the turnover we might see and just, you know, an overall kind of like an exit meeting uh, when it comes to the players on this team. But honestly, it's kind of turned into that completely. So I'm just going to stick with that. We'll talk about it. Um, I got the list of free agents in front of me, actually, and I'll go over them and we'll kind of talk about what we think of all the defensive players that are free agents. And then we'll transition over to the offensive side of the ball. But again, the defense wasn't the reason they lost this game. There were bigger reasons they lost this game. I'm also not going to pin it all on one thing. Um, It was a combination of things, but the defense still I think has a long way to go and uh, part of that is you know upgrading some of these players but there are a handful of free agents this year I'm going to go over the defensive ones we'll go down the line and we'll talk about who we resign let go and why and all that good stuff so I think we're kind of in agreement on Tyron like if he comes back okay um Tag and trade is an intriguing option, and I think it gives you the most um, the most flexibility. So I, tag and trade, would that be the ideal scenario with Tyron? Yeah, uh, specifically to Detroit. Yeah. I'm very <laughs> set on that. Uh, I think him and Dan Campbell would be an interesting locker room combination. I'm not saying they'd be bad. I just think they'd be interesting. And – uh, I don't want him to go to Baltimore. I think it'd be funny to send him to a place he doesn't want to go. And so, yeah, tag and trade him to Detroit. Fair enough. Uh, then there's Jaron Reed, um, the so-called welcome edition. Bye. Of the rush. <laughs> Bye. He's... I don't usually hate Alabama players, but Reed can kick rocks. He's nothing special. If he leaves, Tershawn Wharton will probably take his snaps, which is not a bad thing. So. Dude, Tershawn Wharton's better. Yep. Uh, I like Tershawn Wharton. I think he has more upside. And obviously, it would be cheaper to just let Reed go. Next, there's Melvin Ingram. Uh, no-brainer. You bring him back. Uh, maybe a one- or two-year deal. Nothing too crazy, but I think he wants to be here. And we failed him by not getting him a ring this year. So uh, bring him on for another ride. Yeah, uh, I'm not expecting to give him a huge contract like Arrowhead Live is for some reason. But like you said, a one- or two-year deal, come in, remain our best edge rusher. Sounds good to me. Yep. Uh, Next is Charverius Ward. Like, okay. Bye. I actually am okay with bringing him back if he's cheap. But obviously it would be – with the idea that you still need to upgrade at corner, like depth piece, fine. I think he played better this year than he did last year for sure. So I don't know. We'll see. If he's cheap, but I have a sneaking suspicion he's going to be like Kendall Fuller and some random team is going to give him a massive deal. He's going to get overpaid by another team, I feel like, as well. He is better than Kendall Fuller, I will say that. But that's a very low bar. 
Yep. Next we have Mike Hughes. Goodbye. Never Bye. see him again. Never again. Uh, then there's Dan Sorensen. Bye. Yep. Also goodbye. Uh, he's definitely aged out. Then there's Ben Neiman. Also Bye. goodbye. <laughs> Alex Okafor. Bye. Yep. Uh, I I think you can. I think next year you need to see. I, I don't have big expectations for Josh Kando, but he probably needs to develop enough to take the Alex. No, he should. Role. I want fresh faces. That's fair too. That's fair too. Then there's Derek Nadi. I think you bring him back. I mean, he has uh, his role. He's good at it. I don't it. think he'll be expensive, right? I I wouldn't think so. No. Yeah, give him just like a one more year. See he's what a, happens. He's a one dimensional player. Um, yeah. Yeah, but he's good at what he does. Then there's Dorian O'Daniel. Um, Bye. I mean, I'd be fine with bringing him back as a depth linebacker, but they don't see him intent on playing him at all. Therefore, I mean, I think if the I think if anyone but Spags was the defensive coordinator, he'd actually see the field. But yeah. Oh well, he'll probably go. Armani Watts kind of feel the same way about him that I feel about O'Daniel. Uh, if they bring him back. You know, I would kind of like it. I think he'd be a better third safety than Dan Sorensen, but they've just never been really intent on giving Armani Watts snaps. Uh, I thought when Armani was on the field, he looked solid. I'd be down to bring him back. Yeah, I just don't know if the team will. But those are all the defensive free agents. Um, so that probably gives. So you how guys- many? How many of those guys did we want back? Two. Yeah, like two or three. It was like Ingram Watts. And yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so the cap's not going to be a problem, basically. No, yeah, they're going to have plenty of cap space. I've I've seen a lot of misconceptions already about the cap space the Chiefs will have. Someone tweeted about how Mahomes' cap space goes up, or his cap hit goes up to thirty million next year. The Chiefs are going to be in cap hell. They're going to convert it to a signing bonus, just like they did last year. They're going to cut Clark. They're going to cut Hitchens. They're going to have money to spend. It's not going to be an issue. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe the issue, or maybe uh, a tighter cap would be good because then it would cause us to make tough decisions or quote unquote tough decisions, like getting rid of Clark's bum ass. Right. That's pretty much it on the defense. Uh, do you have any parting words for the 2021-2022 Kansas City Chiefs defense and what they did against the Bengals? No, I just hope it looks very different because I'm sick of a lot of players. Yeah, I feel the same way. Switching to the offense, though, uh, they were rolling in this game. And, you know, the most frustrating part about this loss is that they had the game won multiple times and they blew it every single time. The coin toss, um, the two minute warning, the end of the first half, uh, Mahomes was God mode, essentially all postseason, um, including the first half of this game. And then, I mean, I mean, we were there for it. They scored just about every time they touched the ball. Then the second half came and he turned into Matt castle. Like I, 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 I truly do not know what happened. Uh, the play that, like, comes to mind is, uh, like, you said that, like, uh, Julie pointed out how Mahomes was running around and just, like, scrambling around in the pocket and didn't look like he knew what to do. Yeah. And I feel like what happened was Mahomes got gun shy. I think it was Von Bell that picked him off. Uh, yep. And I feel like after that play – he was scared to blow the game and that caused him to in turn blow the game because usually uh, he, when his hero ball bullshit works, it works. And I think he was scared to do it when he needed to do it. Like he's done it before and it cost us games, but like late in that game, we needed that hero ball. And I think he was just too scared to do it because of that pick. Well, I think the Chiefs roster building has led the team to this point where Patrick Mahomes' hero ball is what they're used to, and they rely on it so much. And when you rely on it as much as the Chiefs do, um, it's just a dangerous game to play. And uh, this time Mahomes wasn't there for them, and they needed someone else to take over the game. 
uh, and it just didn't happen. Andy Reid also abandoned the run in the second half, and he abandoned the run with Jarek McKinnon specifically, which I think was a massive mistake. Um, the Bengals just continued dropping guys back in coverage to try and stop the pass game with Kelsey and Hill, and no one else wanted to step up. Uh, Mahomes looked flustered. Uh, yeah, it took too long to make some of these decisions. I also thought there was a couple times where he stayed back to try and find someone open when he should have just took off and ran like he did against Buffalo. And it was really hard to watch in person how they just broke down. I mean, it was a complete meltdown, and it's something that is a disturbing trend with Andy Reid. And Andy Reid is a Hall of Fame coach. There's no doubt about that. But this happens a lot more than you would like for someone that's going to be considered a Hall of Fame coach. Andy Reid is a great coach if you're a middling team looking to make the playoffs. If you are a team that wants to win a Super Bowl, he is a horrible coach for you to have. And people are like, oh, you wouldn't win anything without Andy. Who's better than him? Who's had more success? Da, 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 da. But I feel like if you give other coaches this team, like, I don't know, Sean Payton. If Sean Payton was the coach of this team, I think there's a very real chance we win the Super Bowl because, like, uh, off the top of my head, a lot of Sean Payton's losses aren't because of poor coaching. And like when Andy loses, or let me rephrase that. If you put most coaches, I'd say the majority of the league uh, as head coach of the Kansas City Chiefs in the second half of this game, I'd say about 30 of them win that game. And Andy Reid is one of the two that don't. And that's just what frustrates me and why I can't stand Andy despite the regular season success and that one Super Bowl run is I compare him a lot to Mike McCarthy where they win a lot of regular season games, but if they're going to win a Super Bowl, they need to be bailed out by high-end talent. And that's what happened in Super Bowl 54. That's what happened in 2011 or no, whenever the Packers won it. I'm not sure where that was. They won in spite of their morbidly obese offensive-minded coaches with terrible play-calling issues or and clock management. Can't forget that. But um, that's just what frustrates me about Andy. And would a lot of teams love to be in the position the Kansas City Chiefs are? Yes, absolutely. But I think we're pretty close, if not already have uh, outgrown Andy Reid. Phrasing of that was poor, but you get my point. No, yeah, I completely understand. And he's still the same coach that he was before and after we won the Super Bowl. Mahomes just went God mode in that Super Bowl, and that's why we won. Uh, towards the end of the game, he bailed us out. And Damian Williams. Yeah. He still should be on a roster. And Damian Williams. Uh, the off- I think, okay, I said this this morning, and I want to hear what you think about this. I kind of feel like that the Chiefs all year really just didn't feel right. Like, it just didn't feel like the same Chiefs, and it was the same issues always rearing their ugly head. They showed spurts of really good football, but they would never put it all together, which I guess isn't too much different from past seasons. I feel like that has been something you could say, but I felt it more so this year. There were a lot of holes in this team that I felt were neglected, and they just kept showing up over and over and over again, and the problems like – the offense stalling and going stagnant or shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, I, I think eventually that was going to catch up with them. And there was just this feeling, even during that win streak, that, I don't know, man, like it's just, there's something off about this team. And I think that's why we ultimately saw them lose is because uh, a lot of those issues came back, kind of like they did at other points this year, kind of like the game against the Bengals in the regular season. Um it's stuff like that that really concerns me. It, there, there are disturbing trends with this team, and I I think it's going to take some turnover, not just with the roster, but also with the coaching staff to probably fix it. Yeah, uh, I'm very much expecting an offseason like uh, the one after we lost the AFC Championship last time. Like, you cannot afford to screw around. And, uh, like, I fully believe we've seen the full potential of the roster at this current state, and there needs to be major changes. Like, uh, replace Frank Clark with, I don't know, Chandler Jones, bring in Allen Robinson, go balls to the wall all in and try and get another Super Bowl. Like, you can't afford to sit here and screw around. 
Yeah, they they need to move on from players that we'll bring up in a second and try to upgrade. We wanted a wide receiver too last year. This team didn't. I mean, they tried for a few guys and missed out, but there was never really a backup plan. And then there's times where Byron Pringle is your third best option. And Byron Pringle is fine, but he can't be your third best option. You see the way some of these other teams are stacking up. The Rams did it when they signed OBJ. They got OBJ, Cooper Cup, and they would have had Robert Woods if he didn't get hurt. That team has so many damn options. Tom Brady had so many damn options when they won the Super Bowl. A.B., Godwin, Evans. Um and the running game too with take uh, Godwin from the Bucks. That's yeah. what our offseason should be. I would love Chris Godwin on this team. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And then like even the Bengals who are now going to the Super Bowl instead of us. Everyone clowned on them for passing over Penny Sewell and drafting Jamar Chase, but look where that's gotten them. Chase is amazing. And then they got T. Higgins, Joe Mixon, CJ Uzoma, and uh Tyler Boyd on top of that. I mean, the Chiefs are top heavy, but they don't have the depth at the skill position that some of these other teams have, and it's kind of an issue. Yeah, uh, I feel like top heavy is a word I use to describe this team a lot, and it's very accurate. And I'd like to get some talent more evenly distributed throughout the roster. And it doesn't even have to be guys that I mentioned earlier, like Chandler Jones and uh, Allen Robinson, I just want, like, uh, to hit on these, like, underrated moves. Like, nobody thought anything when we drafted some unknown corner from South Carolina in the sixth round. Rashad Fenton is now one of, if not our best corner. Uh, No one thought anything about some secondary player from L.A. Tech. Legeria Sneed has been a monster. No one cared when we signed some running back before the draft. Jarek McKinnon was fantastic this playoff run. You just need to hit on stuff like that. And I think those are the type of moves they needed to make this past offseason, but instead they opted for guys like, okay, like bringing Ben Neiman back. They brought Ben Neiman back, and it's like, okay. But then you let Damian Wilson walk for dirt cheap and go to the Jaguars. Could yeah. you imagine if this team kept Damian Wilson? I mean, that guy was yeah, great wh- for you. Why would you pick Ben Neiman over Damian Wilson? Damian Wilson was the textbook definition of a solid player. I know. A linebacking core, uh, I'd feel better with Damian Wilson than Hitchens. Go out there with Bolton, Gay, and Damian Wilson, and that linebacking core is better than any combination that we could have right now. How long did he sign with the Jaguars for? Because I'd love to bring him back. He kind of reminds me of the linebacker version of Rakeem Nunez-Roches, where he's just a good player that no one talks about. He was a short-term deal. It was one or two years. He might be a free agent again this offseason. Yeah, I'd love to have him back. I I could definitely see them making a move like that. Um, And then like a a better third safety. I also thought, you know, the cornerback market and the defensive end market were begging us to get in on, and they just didn't really do anything. They opted with the same guys again, Ward, no Breland. They brought in Mike Hughes. Mike Hughes cannot be your highest investment in cornerback in the off season. Like, I don't know why Veach just hates investing in corners so much. He refuses to draft one before the fourth round and he refuses to pay any of them anything, which Fingers crossed that means he won't pay Ward, but I I want to draft. Dude, imagine if we took Sauce Gardner at 30. Yeah. Just something like that. That would be perfect. Well, it's been a while since we had a true shutdown corner. And I like Legarius Need and his career outlook, but you got you gotta have someone to go with him. You really do. I think your two and three corners as Legarius Sneed and Rashad Fenton are really good. But you need a number one. Like yep. your true uh who like we none of our corners I feel comfortable with going up against Jamar Chase. We need a corner who can uh, really shut down Jamar Chase. That's or any like, any yeah. other elite receiver for that matter. Kind of like how Belichick used to use Gilmore. I'm not expecting a corner as good as Gilmore, but uh, Gilmore would just go on the biggest threat that uh, that offense had, whether it was like Kelsey. Uh, or I mean, he would always put Gilmore on Sammy Watkins, but that's beside the point. Just it doesn't matter if it's a tight end, wide receiver, whoever. Just the biggest threat that Bill Belichick felt to that defense. That's who Gilmore would go on, and we need a guy like that. 
Yep, I agree. We've kind of drifted away from the offense a bit, but I'll get back to that. I think everyone kind of gets the general idea of what we're saying about the offense and some of their issues. Uh, they rely on Patrick Mahomes' hero ball too much. Um, they have the ability to run the ball with the offensive line, but they kind of go away from the run, and I think they use the wrong running back. Uh, more times than not, uh, they just get stagnant too often, and they need a third option besides Kelsey and Hill that defenses have to take seriously because I think they struggled to get open a lot at times in the second half, and there was nowhere else for Mahomes to go, and that's why he held on to the ball. Um, but let's go over the free agents on the offensive side of the ball. So first is Mike Remmers. Uh, he was on a one-year deal. He's... Yeah, I, I, I think he might retire if I'm being completely honest. Uh next is Byron okay. Pringle. Next is Byron Pringle. He is okay. Cannot be your wide receiver too. Uh he had a nice year. If he's but... your wide receiver four, you're in a pretty good spot. But if yeah. he's anything higher than that, you're not looking good. Yeah. I mean he's he's a fine player. He's twenty nine years old and barely he he hadn't even had a thousand career receiving yards before this season like, nobody's gonna give him anything he'll be a cheap guy to bring back i don't know i feel like i could see a team going out and give him like an albert wilson type deal but we'll uh, see. i'm not sure about that we'll see but if we if he's cheap bring him back if he wants anything significant he can he can have it i don't care yeah. uh, he can take it somewhere else next we got running back daryl williams i pretty i'm pretty sure they'll bring him back and i'd be okay with that he just had a year like where him. he had a thousand yards from scrimmage so uh, and i don't think it would be too expensive either best lsu back on the roster <laughs> yep uh next demarcus robinson goodbye i'm i'm so done with him like th this is another type of player that kind of we were referencing a minute ago like they just bring back just just because when there's other guys out there Demarcus Robinson does not have a place on this team. Stop I don't have bringing anything against Demarcus like you do. I don't hate him, but I want fresh blood. Like, yeah. We need some fresh faces. I'm tired of some of these guys. Like, God, if they bring Demarcus Robinson back for another year, it's like, come on. You, you, could, you couldn't think of anything else. But, well, and that that's also when they need, like, Cornell Powell. Like, he needs to step up next year, and he can be the Demarcus Robinson. Like, it's... That's how I feel. Uh, next, there's Blake Bell. I don't know about Blake Bell, if they'll bring him back or not. Maybe Give they Blake get Bell the ball! <laughs> Belldozer, baby! Maybe they'll give him, or they'll give uh, Noah Gray all of his snaps. I'm not sure. But if they brought him back, wouldn't be too upset. You also have Jody Fortson coming back next season, who I think was actually starting to become a big part of this offense right before he got hurt. So we'll see about that one. Uh, also I mean... Uh, the one thing I have to say about Blake Bell is he brings nothing to this offense outside of the ability to QB sneak. I'm sure we could probably find another player uh, able to do that. Maybe we like bring in Tyree Jackson or something. But uh, that's what I love about Blake Bell is that he'll come in and do the QB sneak so Mahomes doesn't have to. He doesn't do anything else. We don't need him outside of that, but I do appreciate that one play. But like I said, I'm sure we could get someone else to do that. Uh, yeah uh then there's austin Blythe, the backup center if they bring him back should have yeah. traded him why did we not ship him off at the deadline there were other there were teams that were like looking for centers mid-season we could have probably gotten like a seventh round pick for Blythe. why did he spend the entire season on roster i think they just wanted the depth is what it was but uh next is jerick mckinnon I think you bring, bring him back. back. It's a no-brainer. And yeah. it's really a shame that it took this long for him to become a big part of the offense. But uh, Michael Burton, fullback. Yep, bring back Josh yes, Gordon. Yes, I love Michael Burton. Yep, Josh Gordon. I think he's done. He obviously I'd like didn't show though. anything. I think, I think he'll stick around for camp, but I wouldn't expect too much. Uh, Andrew Wiley, honestly. Bye. Bye. I'm tired of him. They need to I okay, hot take right now. I think they need to draft a right tackle and I'm concerned about Lucas. That's Dan. not a hot take. Are you kidding me? That's a that's a layup. Uh, some people are like really sold on Yang. I'm not. I don't think he's I he hasn't even shown the ability to stay healthy. So yeah. Uh but Wiley, he he was good for a third string right tackle. 
but very very low bar yes uh orlando brown i think you sign him to his long-term deal this offseason yeah. don't mess around with to. that um marcus kemp i'm kind of sad. i'm kind of, i don't know why he gets offensive snaps and i know he's one of tobe's guys but you can find guys like marcus kemp to play special teams for you and not have to play them on offense either like fire tobe and bring in Basaccia. i know that he's like verbally committed to chicago but he's taking interviews in uh jacksonville so give him what he wants i like Basaccia. i really thought he should have kept the raiders job but yeah i don't know if like the Raiders special teams was good, but Basaccia is just the type of guy that I want in the locker room. Yeah, I really like him. Uh, next, Jody Fortson. I think he showed a lot. Got to bring him back next year. And then Derek Gore. I also like Derek Gore. I would bring him back too. I, I think you agree on both of those, right? Yeah, I like both of them. Yeah, so those are the offensive free agents for the Kansas City Chiefs and how we feel about them. And then – I don't know, Connor, what are some of the other moves you would like consider on offense, like outside of the organization? Like you kind of already talked about like Allen Robinson and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I mentioned like Allen Robinson and um, Chandler Jones are like the two big ticket guys I want. And of course, I'm going to be posting 500 million mock drafts uh, as we get into the offseason. But there's not really any free agents that come to mind outside of those two guys. I'm not really even sure who of, or who is available in free agency, but I would like to address safety and running back in uh, free agency. And I want cheap guys. I would be completely fine because Clyde better not be the running back. And we got production out of guys like Daryl and McKinnon. And I was going to use examples like how the Ravens handled their running backs uh, room after all the injuries Latavius Murray got cut Devonte Freeman was a free agent and they got solid production from those guys and the Jaguars got a Pro Bowl running back out of an undrafted free agent um, and the Broncos did the same with Philip Lindsay uh, James Robinson was the Jaguars guy uh, so I'd be uh, I was going to use those guys as examples for running back production over Clyde but we already do that we just keep giving the ball to Clyde anyway. So, yeah, keep doing what you're doing with the running back position outside of Clyde. You're getting good production out of these guys like Derek Gore, Jarek McKinnon, Daryl Williams, but you keep forcing the ball to Clyde. I don't understand that. And I know, like, the only running back I'd be cool with drafting with is Tyler – or I'd be eh, – I'd be cool with drafting is Tyler Beatty due to my Mizzou bias. Yeah. But realistically, I know a lot of people are going to want to draft a running back – and I can understand that line of thinking, but I really don't because I think we have enough issues on this team, especially going through that free agency list. I don't want a lot of those guys back, and I want to cut a lot more guys on top of that. So we really need to use like every draft pick we can. And uh, I feel like a lot of the things I say about running back, maybe not to as big of an extent, but can be applied to the safety position as well. And I'd like to address that in the same area, but I want to draft like corners, wide receivers. I want to sign pass rushers, uh, like invest highly in pass rushers. And like you said, we need a right tackle. And I feel like a good GM could be able to come out of this uh, off season with a pretty good roster. And I don't know if I trust Veach to completely turn over the roster uh, like he did when he took over for Dorsey with that uh, off season between uh, 53 and 54 uh, Super Bowls. That is, uh, I don't know if he'll do that again because the guys he's going to be getting rid of this time are his guys, but I'd like to see him get rid of his shitty guys. Yeah. Just a lot of player shedding that needs to be done. Fresh uh, faces. That's the theme of this off season. I also think something we kind of have not really touched a lot yet that I think really needs to happen is moving on from Eric the enemy and elevating Kafka to OC finally to get um, new fresh ideas uh, with the I offense. prefer Doug Peterson, but I'm fine with that. Well, I think Doug Pete. Well, I don't know, man. Doug Peterson, I would bring him back as OC, but I wonder where his head is at. 
and if another team might try to go after him like i could see him going to chicago to be ebrick loose's oc but i'm not sure yet I know he's been getting head coaching interviews like he interviewed with the Saints today, I think. But let's be real. Dennis Allen is going to be the next head coach of the Saints. But um, I feel like with just the way the uh, coaching carousel is turning right now, it's probably going to be Mike McDaniel in Miami, going to be, uh, I don't know, uh, Byron Leftwich is probably going to get it worked out in Jacksonville. Uh, Jim Harbaugh might go to the Vikings. It's just kind of hard to find a spot where Dougie fits so if you let the enemy walk uh he'll probably get picked up by uh he could be picked up as Eberflus's OC maybe but um I'd like to bring in Dougie as the offensive coordinator and you could sell it to him as saying like look you're not going to be a head coach but you can come back to Casey you have a good relationship with Andy and uh you can just come in be the OC for a year and then go leave for your next head coaching gig. That's the pitch that I'd give to Dougie to bring him back. Yeah. Regardless, I think the enemy's time is done. So. Bye-bye. And I'd love Mike Zimmer as DC, but if Spags is the DC, whatever. Yep. That's kind of how I feel. But uh, after all that, do you have any uh, parting words for the chiefs offense and uh, how they did uh, against the Bengals in this game? They did poorly. <laughs> very poorly and I I don't know if we even mentioned this we probably did but I'd also just like to bring back up the point that Mahomes was super flustered and that's very concerning to me yeah and, man it was a legacy game. like anytime a Super Bowl appearance is on the line and you lose to a team that really was worse and had the worst quarterback like that's not a stain that you want is, on it, your is he even the worst quarterback anymore because in the second half of the game Burrow very clearly outplayed Mahomes. Well, but, uh, you know, looking at it the other way, though, he was way better than Burrow in the first half. And really, I don't think Burrow had a great game. I think the Chiefs just sold it. Uh, But I think Mahomes obviously has the highest ceiling of any of the quarterbacks, I think. I mean, you could agree with that, right? Like, he has the highest ceiling uh, of Burrow, Allen, you know, all those guys in the AFC. At least that we've seen, like, there's still room for – for some of these other guys to grow but I feel like a lot of the blame can be put on Mahomes and I feel like he took a lot of the blame and I know a lot of people are going to say oh well I'm glad that Mahomes is pissed off and motivated for next year was he not pissed off about losing the Super Bowl like what happened like what happened between like I don't know if it was Andy or if it was Mahomes making poor decisions and you bring up the call or we talked about the call before half that pretty much cost us the game in hindsight. I th- I think it was Mahomes' decision to go for it, which, again, was the right call. And I think Andy initially called uh, the quick route that I was saying should have been the call. But then Mahomes just dumped it off to Tyreek in the flats. I don't think that was supposed to happen. I just think that he overthought it. And something happened at some point in the game that got in Mahomes' head, and I don't know what that was. Probably the enemy calling plays. He was fine. He was slinging it. And uh, in the first half, he looked fantastic. Like that one throw to Tyreek, he looked inhuman. But the second half, something changed. And I don't think you can necessarily even put it on the enemy for play calling because there were instances where receivers were wide open Mahomes just got gun shy and that interception might have caused it, but the interception might've also been a result of it. So I don't know what happened to him, but that's really where the game was lost. Yeah. I wish we could conduct a deep investigation into that because from the second quarter of the Pittsburgh Steelers playoff game to the end of the first half in this last playoff game against the Bengals, Mahomes put together maybe the best stretch I've ever seen from any QB. Like, he was amazing. And the drop-off in the second half was just uncanny. Yeah, I I don't know what happened. I don't know, like, what you could even attribute it to at this point. Like, because it wasn't, like, the scheming by the Bengals just – 
something got in his head yeah and there was even a quote from the Bengals. i forget who it was that said it but they were like we didn't change much in the second half we just stuck to what we were doing and the chiefs just you know they kept firing and the Bengals' defense just had an answer for it maybe he just saw his brother twerking on the sideline <laughs> and decided i don't want to win yeah maybe but I, that, I don't know. And before it starts, I'm going to shut down all the revenge tour crap right now. This was supposed to be the revenge tour. You don't get two revenge tours. You don't re- uh, avenge your revenge tour. That's stupid. Yeah. Also, um, Mahomes, the Grim Reaper nickname, uh, that's over. It lasted. And it was week. cool. It was so cool. I know. <laughs> so cool for a week. But it's over now. Uh, I think also this podcast is over now. I think we got everything in that we needed to say. I'm ready to move on from this game. Uh, I want the Super Bowl to be over quick, and I would just like to move on to the offseason already. I hope the Bengals win. Oh, I I do too. I like Joe Burrow. I I I want the Bengals to win. Yeah. But I also think the Bengals are a deserving team. They're a likable team outside of Eli Apple. Yeah. (laughs) Screw Eli Apple. He Uh, sucks. Why does he talk so much? (laughs) I don't know, man. Oh, do you want to tell, real real quick before we wrap up, do you want to tell everyone our Trey Flowers story? Oh, yeah, we have a couple stories before the game. So um, I mentioned Prime Sports Network earlier, but we have this friend Tino, and occasionally we'll uh, do stuff with him over on the Prime Sports Network YouTube channel. Uh, go ahead and check that one out. It's the one with the black logo. It's also available on all podcast platforms. Uh, so go ahead and check that out if, if you want to hear more from uh, me and sometimes Josh. But we were there with our friend Tino, and he's obviously a Seahawks fan, and he hates Trey Flowers. And uh, obviously Trey Flowers plays for the Bengals. And we were sidelined for not on the sideline, but like the lowest level that the seats go uh, watching pregame warmups, really nothing too special. And he recognized Trey just in, you know, his long sleeve T-shirt and pants warming up. And, um, you know, I yelled out Trey, Trey, trying to get him to react. And, you know, we did that for a few players no surprise none of them reacted at all because you know they're they have their headphones in they're in the zone they're focused on the game and they're told not to react to fans but when trey was headed towards the tunnel i point to tino and i yell trey he's a seahawks fan maybe josh you can like insert the video in here i don't know if you do that or not (laughs) oh yeah i can do it i'll do it screw it i'll do it uh yeah you should insert the video Trey, he's a Seahawks fan. <laughs> <laughs> Say he's a Seahawks fan, dude reacts. And I just thought that was hilarious. A lot of Chiefs fans might not get that because they might not be aware of the drama with Trey Flowers and the Seahawks. But it was just a hilarious little reaction if you understood what was going on. Yeah, he gave Bye. he gave the flattest, you know, just look. And I I, I think I think he heard it, and at first he was like, "Oh, cool. oh, oh, oh," because like he 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 knew he sucked with the Seahawks. Like the dude got cut from the Seahawks. He sucks but, with the Bengals. But yeah, well, he 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 was waived by the Seahawks. Didn't get picked up by anybody on the waiver wire, and then signed with the Bengals. And he was terrible, terrible in Seattle. And I think he knew that we were kind of making fun of him, and he was like, "Oh, shit." And I also met Chief Saholic, my best friend. Yeah, that was funny too. But yeah, you could also put up the picture of me and Chief Saholic. Maybe I'll make it the thumbnail. <laughs> yes. For those of you that don't know, uh, he's not my biggest fan, and I'm not his biggest fan. So meeting him was pretty funny to us. They settled their differences. Oh yeah. I think well. <laughs> Chief Saholic only knows Connor by his Twitter username. And then Connor was like, oh, yeah, it's uh, here's my Twitter name. And then uh, he was like, oh, cool, bro. And then I think he I think he knew right after he said that, oh, it's you. But then he didn't want. to. Yeah, because I said Super Bowl Sorensen. And that's not what I am anymore. And he's like, oh, got it, man. 
and I said, at Brady Reeks, and he didn't react too kindly to that one. He just seemed like, oh, oh. Yep, he knew. <laughs> Which was just hilarious to me. He knew, just like Trey Flowers knew. But I think that's a, I think that's a good note to end the podcast. So yeah, I'm gonna nice go ahead. Little positive ending. Yeah, I'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Also, I'm not going to any more Chiefs games uh, for a while. I, I think the Bengals one was my last one. And uh, anyway, I will link Connor's stuff in the description. Uh, if you're still watching this, uh, I don't know why you would be, but like, share, and subscribe. Some more Chiefs fans can find this, and we will see you all in the next one.